بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته In the last several weeks, we've been covering the response of Quraysh and the tactics that they used in opposing the da'wah of the Prophet wasallam. And so we mentioned uh, pressure, putting pressure on his uncle Abu Talib. We mentioned false accusations that they would accuse him of, mockery, ridicule, disrupting the recitation of the Qur'an so others don't listen to it, ideological warfare, trying to smear the message of Islam, and bargaining and negotiating. That was the last one that we covered, bargaining and negotiating with the Prophet ﷺ to see if he will compromise in his preaching of Islam and giving da'wah. And so after all those failed, they tried other tactics and so today we look at two other tactics that Quraysh used in their opposition to the Prophet ﷺ. The first of these is to allure him through temptations. And so Quraysh, like many other people, they had a world view that was dunya-centered. Where they think that Everyone else is like them, attracted to the dunya and chasing after the dunya. And they'll do everything for the dunya. And, you know, this belief of theirs is because they don't believe in the akhirah. So they said that we have one life to live and that's it. After that, there's nothing. So they're attracted by the glitter and the glamour of the dunya. And they thought that, look, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's a human being like us. He has desires just like us. So if we have failed to stop him so far, then let us try to lure him by offering him, by offering him certain things which are temptations for most people. in exchange for him to stop preaching Islam. And so one day, Quraysh, they got together and they said, let us find someone among us who is an expert in poetry and magic and let him go and meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and let him make these offers to him. And so they decided that this man would be who? Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. He was one of the elders of Quraysh. And he was one of the enemies of the Prophet And he was an expert in these areas. In poetry, uh, fortune telling magic and so on and so forth so Utba ibn Rabi'a went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 
And he asked him, Tell me, O Muhammad, who is better? You or Abdul Muttalib? Who is Abdul Muttalib? Who is Abdul Muttalib? His grandpa, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Now this question was a setup. In the society of Arabia, there was a lot of respect and glorification for ancestry, for our forefathers, and the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was from the nobility which was respected not only by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but also everyone else in Mecca. They would not tolerate anyone speaking bad about their ancestors. So this was a setup. And so when Utba asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet ﷺ remained silent. He didn't say anything. So Utbah said, If you claim those men to be better than you, the fact is that they worshipped idols. They worship gods that you have criticized. And if you claim to be better than them, then speak. So we can hear what you have to say. So you see how it's a setup. If they were better, Abdul Muttalib and the rest of your ancestors, remember these are people who are respected and we can't say anything bad about them. If they are better and we accept that they are better, then they worshipped these gods that you are criticizing. They are on the same, they were on the same religion that we are on today. So he was a smart man. And so either they were better or you are better. And if you are better, then this is a red line for us. We will not tolerate you saying that you're better than them. And then he went on to say, By God, we have never seen any fool more harmful to his people than you. You have caused division and dissension among us, criticized our religion, and so disgraced us in the eyes of the Arabs that the rumor has it among the Arabs that there is a magician or a sorcerer among Quraysh. Now, Utba is blaming Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the rumor that there is a magician among Quraysh. But the question is, who was it who spread this rumor to begin with? It was Quraysh. They're the ones who started calling the Prophet ﷺ a magician, a sorcerer, a madman. And so now Utba is blaming the Prophet ﷺ for his own act which has caused them embarrassment. So he's saying, you've embarrassed us. Rumor has it that there is a magician, a madman among Quraysh. But yet this is the rumor that they're the ones who spread. Then Utbah said, by God, it seems all we have to wait for is the cry of a pregnant woman for us all to be at one another with swords till we wipe ourselves out. What he meant by this is that in a very short time, we might be fighting each other because of what you have brought. And so Utba was saying that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam has caused disunity among Quraysh when we were living peacefully. And now we're about to fight one another and slit each other's throats because of you. Then after this introduction, Utba starts making his offer. And so he said to the Prophet wasallam, If it is money that you are in need of, we will gather all of our wealth to make you the richest man among Quraysh. If it is women that you need, then choose any of the women of Quraysh that you wish, and we will marry ten of them to you. 
in another narration, which will come later on, he said, if it is status that you seek, then we will make you our superior, and your word, your word will be final. If it is a leadership that you seek, then we will make you our king. And if the one who comes to you is a demon or a spirit, referring to Jibreel alayhi salam, and you can't avoid it, you know, you can't avoid this, this uh, spell that you're under and this, this demon that comes to you, then we will help to cure you and invest all of our wealth in that. Now, we should notice here that the Prophet wasallam allowed Utbah to go on with this nonsense without interrupting him. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was a very good listener. Even if it happened to be his opponents, and even though nothing that he was saying made any sense, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sat there listening calmly. When Utbah finished, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, Oh Utbah, are you done? Afaragat. And so he replied, yes. And then the Prophet ﷺ did not respond to Utbah with his own words. But rather he started reciting the Qur'an to him. He started reciting the Qur'an. And not just any verses, but verses that carried a certain message. And so he started reciting the beginning of Surah Fussilat. Hamim, Tanzilum min ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hamim, this is a revelation from ar-Rahman, from ar-Rahim. Kitabun Fussilat ayatuhu Qur'anan arabiyyan liqawmi ya'lamun. It is a book whose verses are perfectly explained. A Qur'an in Arabic for people who know. بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا فَأَعْرَضَ أَكْثَرُهُمْ فَهُمْ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ Delivering good news and a warning. Yet most of them turn away, and so they do not hear. وَقَالُوا قُلُوبُنَا فِي أَكِنَّةٍ مِمَّا تَدْعُونَا إِلَيْهِ وَفِي آذَانِنَا وَقْرْ وَمِنْ بَيْنِنَا وَبَيْنِكَ حِجَابٍ فَاعْمَلْ إِنَّنَا عَامِلُونَ They say, the kuffar, they say, our hearts are veiled against what you are calling us to. And there is deafness in our ears. And there is a barrier between us and you. So do whatever you want, and we will also do what we want. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ فَاسْتَقِيمُوا إِلَيْهِ وَاسْتَغْفِرُوا وَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ Allah commands the Prophet ﷺ, O oh Prophet, say to them, I am only a man like you. I'm only a human being like you. But it has been revealed to me that your God is only one God. So take the straight way towards him and seek his forgiveness. And woe to the mushrikun. And then the ayat continue. Describing the mushrikun and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about himself being the creator of the heavens and the earth. And then how he created this world. And then... After several ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنْ أَعْرَضُوا فَقُلْ أَنْذَرْتُكُمْ صَاعِقَةً مِثْلَ صَاعِقَةِ عَادٍ وَثَمُودٍ Allah says, if they turn away, then say to them, O Muhammad, I warn you of a mighty blast, like the one that befell Ad and Thamud. In one narration it says that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited this ayah, Utbah stopped him. And he placed his hand over the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and begged him to stop. Why? Because this ayah is now threatening them with a punishment. The likes that had come to Ad and Thamud. And it's not something that they were unaware of. 
they knew about these civilizations of the past and they knew the punishment that came to them and the Utbah knew deep down inside like the other leaders of Quraysh that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is truthful in whatever he says you know their kufr was one of stubbornness it was not one of you know we don't see that you are true we don't see this as being the truth give us evidence we're not convinced no their kufr as we have seen you know many examples previously their kufr was one of stubbornness while knowing deep down inside that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is truthful and he is receiving you know the revelation from Allah so when Utba heard this he stopped the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then he got up and left and so when when he went back to Quraysh when he went back to Quraysh and told them what had happened he said that he recited from the Quran and I did not understand anything he was saying except that he threatened us with a punishment like that of Ad and Thamud so the people said woe to you He was speaking to you in Arabic and you, and you didn't understand him. And so Utba said, in the name of God, I did not understand what he was talking about. Now these same ayat mention that the kuffar, what do they say? That there is a veil between in front of our hearts and there is deafness in our ears. And so this is a practical example of that. Where they're hearing the Qur'an being recited, but they're not understanding anything of it. And so Allah has sealed their hearts and their eyes and their ears. And so they will never be guided. And so in this example, in this story, we can see that this was one of the tactics used by Quraysh. Let us make him offers. Let us make him these offers. Perhaps this is what he wants. Or perhaps he will be tempted by these offers. Which man doesn't want these things? Status, leadership, wealth, women, and so on and so forth. But the Prophet ﷺ turned down these offers and recited these ayat which mention clearly that look I am simply a messenger from Allah to you قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُحَا إِلَيْهِ I'm a human being just like you the only difference is that I get the revelation from Allah and I have a message to give to convey nothing more And so there are many lessons that we can learn from this tactic used by Quraysh. The first lesson is that in this is evidence of the prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is especially for people who are not convinced. And so part of our da'wah is that we should show how the Prophet ﷺ was indeed truthful. And one of the ways of proving that is by saying, look, if he was a liar, if he was an imposter, if he was a false prophet, then when these offers came to him, he would have fallen for them because this is exactly why false prophets emerge. False prophets who claim that they're receiving revelation from Allah and they've been chosen by Allah, 
it's usually something behind it. They're looking for fame. They're mm. looking for status. They're looking for money. People mm. will give them money. They're looking for leadership. So we say, look, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he was a false prophet, then when these offers came to him, why didn't he accept them? Why didn't he accept them? If that is what he was after. The second lesson that we learn is the importance of staying firm in times of fitna. And this is especially for duhat, a caller to Islam. They should be following in the footsteps of the Prophet wasallam. In remaining firm and steadfast. That when we are tested and tempted with the dunya, and these offers come to us in our face, yes, our human nature is that we're weak, but we need to stand our guard. And we cannot fall prey to such attempts. And so there are many du'at who, ha who, you know, were extremely successful in their da'wah. But they were brought down. And usually they, they came falling down because of one of these three things. Status, money, or women. Status, money, or women. They were tempted with one of these things, and that's it. That was the end of their da'wah. And so we need to be aware of that. And we need to stand our guard and remain firm and steadfast, like the Prophet ﷺ. He did not give up with what? with his task as a messenger and to convey the message of Islam in the face of these these offers and these temptations the third lesson that we learn is remaining focused on the important issues when dealing with kuffar and when giving them da'wah, they will bring up questions and things that are irrelevant or that are secondary. And the purpose of it is to distract us. You know, we, here we are talking about Allah's oneness and how only Allah deserves to be worshipped. And we're talking about Tawheed and how there is no religion on the face of this earth which which emphasizes the issue of Tawheed like, uh, like Islam does. And then they come to us with secondary issues. But look at how Islam treats women. Look at the barbarity. Look at this, look at that. What Utba was doing here is no different. The first thing that he came to the Prophet with, what, what, what was it? What do you say about Abdul Muttalib? It was a setup. It was a trap. This is not the issue. Here I am calling you to Allah and the worship of Allah, and here you are asking me about Abdul Muttalib. He was trying to sidetrack him. But did the Prophet ﷺ fall for that trap? No. He didn't answer him. And so this is exactly how we must be. Why? Because if you answer, then it's going to lead to another question. And then there's going to be back and forth. And then there's going to be this debate. And you're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to get anywhere. And they would have accomplished what they were trying to do. To sidetrack you. To distract you. The fourth lesson that we learn is the importance of replying back with the Qur'an. And so this is only one of many examples 
of how the Prophet ﷺ would use the Qur'an to respond to what people would say. He didn't respond with his own words, although he could have. But he used the words of Allah. And so this teaches us that we should use the concepts of the Qur'an in our da'wah. We shouldn't make our own concepts up when we have the Qur'an and it is sufficient for us. Use the concepts of the Qur'an, the teachings of the Qur'an, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in responding back in our da'wah. We move on after that to the next tactic. And this tactic is basically making challenging demands making challenging demands to the Prophet ﷺ. And so they would come to him and demand for the Prophet ﷺ miracles and things that they knew the Prophet ﷺ could not do. Why? Because he's a human being. But their purpose of doing this was to say, look, we're asking him to do this and he can't. So how can he be a prophet of Allah, a messenger of Allah? If what he is saying is true, then Allah should aid him and do what we are demanding. And so here we should note that there's a difference between these demands of Quraysh and the requests of some of the followers of the prophets when they would ask for miracles. So the followers of Musa alayhi salam, they asked for miracles from Musa alayhi salam. The followers of Isa alayhi salam, as mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah, they said to him, to Isa alayhi salam, and who are these? These are the disciples, Al-Hawariyun. They are the closest companions of Isa alayhi salam. They said, Ya Isa, هل يستطيع ربك أن ينزل علينا مائدة من السماء? Can your Lord send down to us a tablecloth full of food from the sky? So the prophets of Allah, they would reprimand their people and say, you shouldn't be making such requests. But sometimes Allah would send down these requests. But the difference between that and the demands of Quraysh for these miracles, the difference was that the followers of the prophets, they would do it because they wanted more Iman. They wanted their Iman to be strong. So if they see this miracle, their Iman would increase. Similar to what Ibrahim السلام, had asked Allah for. And so in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions uh, the story of Ibrahim السلام, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rebuked him. And so Ibrahim السلام, said, I only want my iman to be strong. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to uh, take a bird and cut it into pieces until the end of the story. So that's one thing. To request a miracle to increase yourself in iman on the other hand, this is not what Quraysh was doing. This was not their reason for their demands. They were not making these demands seeking proof that if we see this happen, then we'll believe in you. They weren't doing it for the sake of guidance. 
Rather, it was a planned smear campaign. If he failed to fulfill our demands, therefore he's not a messenger of Allah. And that's basically what they were trying to do. And then they were going to take this and spread it among the Arabs. And so it was a planned tactic to discredit the Prophet ﷺ. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he narrates that the leaders of Quraysh got together next to the Kaaba. And they sent for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to speak with them. And so they said, we want to exhaust all of the different ways. We don't want to give him any excuse. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came rushing. Why? Because he was hopeful that they might have had a change of heart. Maybe they're ready to accept Islam. And so when he arrived, they said to him, O oh Muhammad, we sent for you to reconcile with you. And so it started, it started with a nice statement. And so they went on to say, by God, we know of no Arab man who has ever brought his people as much trouble as you. You have criticized our religion, ridiculed our values, cursed our gods, and divided our people. Every unpleasant thing possible you have done to make a rift between you and us. In another, another narration they said, we have never seen a person who has brought so much evil on his people like you have. Then they started to throw temptations to the Prophet ﷺ. So the same offers that they made that we mentioned. So they said, O Muhammad, if you are presenting us this message because you are in need of money, then we will collect for you money until we make you the most wealthiest among us. O oh Muhammad, if you are coming up with this religion because you are seeking power, then we will appoint you as a king over us. O oh Muhammad, if you are presenting us with this religion because you are desiring women, then we will choose for you the best ten women of Quraysh and marry them all to you. O oh Muhammad, if you are presenting us with this message because you are possessed by the demons, then we will spend whatever is needed to cure you even if we have to exhaust all of our wealth in the process. So tell us what you want. And so here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa responded by saying that what you have said does not apply to me. I have not brought to you my message seeking your money, nor honor among you, nor sovereignty over you. Allah has sent me to you as a messenger. He has revealed a book to me and ordered me to bring you good news and warn you. Bashiran wa nadira. I have brought you a message from my Lord and I have given you counsel. If you accept what I have brought to you, then that is for your own good on earth and in the akhirah. If you reject it, then I will await Allah's decision until he decides between me and you. So after that, they said to him, if you're turning down all of our offers, then you know how narrow our land is. Anyone who's been to Mecca knows that the city is in the middle of mountains. And so they said, look, you know how narrow our land is. You know how poor we are. You know how difficult life is for us. So how about you go to your Lord who has sent you and you tell him to move these mountains away 
and just level them and make more space for us. And why don't you ask him to make rivers flow in Mecca, just like the rivers of Syria and Iraq. We want to have rivers like others have. We also want you to go to your Lord and tell him to bring back to life some of our forefathers. And we want you to bring back to life Qusay ibn Kilab. And so we mentioned previously Qusay was one of the one of the ancestors of the Prophet وسلم, and he was a very important figure in the lineage of the Prophet The responsibilities of Quraysh were passed down to his children. And so each one took a different responsibility of the affairs of Mecca. So he was a very important individual. They said to him that he was something, he was someone very, very important. We want you to bring him back to life so we can ask him if what you are saying is true or not. And then Muhammad, if you do that and our forefathers agree to what you say, then we will follow you. And so the Prophet ﷺ responded with the same thing. He said, that is not why I have been sent. I have only brought to you from Allah what He has sent me with. I have informed you of what I was sent with. If you accept it, then that is for your own good on earth and in the hereafter. If, if you reject it, then I must patiently wait for Allah's decree and for Him to judge between us. So then they continued. And they said, well, how about if you then ask your Lord to send down an angel who will witness to your truth? Not only that, we also want you to ask him to give us palaces and gardens and treasures of gold and silver. And then how about you do this? Why don't you... Tell him to fulfill your needs because we see that you are seeking a livelihood just like us. You work, you need to work just like, just like we need to work to make income in order to survive. And so they were taunting the Prophet ﷺ that look, if you are so close to Allah, then how come you are working and earning money just like the rest of us. So they were trying to tell him to prove that Allah is close to him by asking for wealth. Go and ask your Lord to give you wealth so that you don't have to work just like the rest of us. Again, the Prophet ﷺ said, I am not going to do that. I am not going to ask such things of my Lord. That is not why I have been sent to you. Allah has sent me to announce and warn. If you accept my message, then that is for your own good fortune on earth and in the hereafter. If you reject it, then I must patiently wait and leave the matter up to Allah until he decides between myself and you. And... This particular request is mentioned in Surah Furqan where Allah mentions they say why is it that he walks around in the marketplaces and eats يأكل الطعام ويمشي في الأسواق Why is it that he eats just like the rest of us? He walks about in the marketplaces you know, buying and selling just like the rest of us. So after the Prophet ﷺ said that, they continued and they said, Well then fine, ask your Lord to bring down the punishment that you have been promising us with. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he said, That is up to Allah. If He wishes, He will do that to you. So then they said, O oh Muhammad, 
doesn't your Lord know these questions that we are asking you? How come he's not helping you in giving an answer? We're making these demands and you're not giving us a satisfactory answer. How come he's not helping you? And then they said, we figured it out. We know who is teaching you all of this. You are being taught this Qur'an of yours by a man in Yamama whose name is Ar-Rahman. And we are never going to believe in that man called Ar-Rahman. They just made up a story of this so-called man in Ar-Rahman. And then one of them said, we worship the angels who are the daughters of God. And that was one of the beliefs of some of the Arabs that the Malaika, the angels, are the daughters of Allah. Allah mentions this in the Quran. Others, they said, we will not believe you until you bring us Allah and the angels before us. Again, even this request is mentioned in the Quran. All of these were just attempts at mocking the Prophet ﷺ and insulting him. It wasn't that they were making these demands because they are seeking evidence of his prophethood. But rather it was just nothing but stubbornness. And so after making all of these demands, they left him. Now one of them came back to the Prophet ﷺ. His name was Abdullah ibn Umayyah. Now one may think that this man felt sorry for the Prophet ﷺ and probably wanted to apologize. So he came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O oh Muhammad, your people have offered you the best offers and you turned them down. And then they asked you to perform miracles for you, and you refused. They asked you to bring down the punishment, and you didn't. Now I tell you what, I am not going to believe in you until you bring a staircase for me, a ladder that goes all the way up to heaven, and then you climb it while I'm watching you, and then you go up to Allah and ask him to write down for you a letter, a note, that you are his prophet, and then you have him sign it, and then we want that document to come down. We want that document to come down accompanied by four angels who will bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. And then look at what he says at the end. He says, you know what? Even if you were to do all of that, I think I'm still not going to believe in you. And so it was a dead end. These were the kinds of people that the Prophet ﷺ was dealing with. He was dealing with a stubborn people who had already made up their minds. That's it, we're not going to believe in you. No matter what you bring, no matter what we see, we are not going to believe. Again, this shows us that their demands that they were making were not honest, were not sincere. It was not like the followers of the prophets who were seeking to increase their Iman and Yaqeen in these Prophets of Allah. No, it was simply stubbornness. And again, like we said, a tactic to try to discredit the Prophet wasallam. that if he is unable to do any of this, then look, he cannot be a truthful messenger sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went back home after this event 
remorseful. He was saddened at this failure. He went with good hopes. You know, when they called him, they thought he thought to himself that perhaps they want to accept Islam and look at how things turned out. So after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam these ayat from Surah Al-Isra. وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوحَا They, Quraysh, said, We will never believe in you until you cause a spring to gush forth from the earth for us. أَوْ تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٌ مِّنْ نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبٍ فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا or until you have a garden of palm trees and vineyards and cause rivers to flow abundantly in it. Or that you cause the sky to fall upon us in pieces. Or that you bring Allah and the angels before us face to face. Or that you have a house of gold or that you ascend up to the heavens this was whose request that man who came to the prophet وسلم, afterwards allah mentions it here or that you ascend up to the heaven and even then we will not believe in you going up until you bring down to us a book that we can read. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّي هَلْ كُنْتُ إِلَّا بَشَرَ الرَّسُولَ Say to them, O Muhammad, Glory be to my Lord, Subhana Rabbi. Am I not only a human messenger? I'm a human being. These are not things that I can do. But I am a messenger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مَنَعَ النَّاسَ أَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا إِذْ جَاءَهُمُ الْهُدَىٰ إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا أَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ بَشَرَ الرَّسُولَ And nothing has prevented people from believing when guidance comes to them except that they say in protest, has Allah sent a human as a messenger? This was one of the things that they objected to. They said, he should be an angel if we're going to believe in him as a messenger from Allah. Why has Allah sent a human as a messenger? And then the answer of Allah comes. The answer of Allah comes, say to them, O Muhammad, had there been angels walking on earth, well settled, we would have surely sent down for them an angel from heaven as a messenger. This is the wisdom behind why Allah sent us a human messenger. Because he is one of us. We share certain things with him. We can relate to him. And if there were angels on earth, then Allah would have surely have sent them an angel as a messenger and not a human. قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ Say sufficient is Allah as a witness between me and you. إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِعِبَادِهِ خَبِيرًا بَصِيرًا He certainly is the all-knowing, all-seeing of his servants. So in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is sufficient as a witness. Don't worry about what they say, O Muhammad. Allah from above the heavens is sufficient as a witness that you are indeed His Messenger. And so these were the demands, these were some of the demands that Quraysh would make. And so in this tactic, there are many lessons. Among them is, first of all, that we should never take 
stubborn people seriously. Never take them seriously. Because such demands by such people are not coming from a sincere heart. And so when you're giving someone da'wah and they're making silly demands, then don't take them seriously. These demands are not coming from a, a heart that is sincere in looking for the truth. And so the atheists of today, they say, if there truly was a God, then he would have appeared before us. He would allow us to see everything. Right? No different than what Quraysh said. Bring Allah and the angels before us face to face. These are requests and demands from people who are not serious. They are demands from a people who have already made up their mind in remaining upon kufr. And so the best thing to do is what? To ignore them, which is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. The second lesson that we learn is the wisdom behind not responding to their demands. And so, why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not fulfill these demands for His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It would have brought him joy. He would have been happy. And so the wisdom behind that, if we were to look in history, we would find that this was not the first time that such demands were made. With all the previous prophets, similar demands were made. And the sunnah of Allah is that when demands are made and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills those demands and the people still disbelieve, then Allah sends His punishment right away. He, annul he annihilates those people. He wipes them off from the face of the earth. As happened with Thamud. What did they ask for? They asked for a miracle. And so Allah sent the she-camel that came out of a mountain. And they still disbelieve and other past nations. When they asked for a miracle and Allah sent it and they still didn't believe, then Allah wiped them off the face of the earth. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhi narrates that Quraysh asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to change Mount Safa into gold. This was one of their silly demands. They said, if you do this, we'll believe in you. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, will you truly believe? They said, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ made dua to Allah for that to happen. And then Jibreel السلام, came and said to the Prophet ﷺ, if you wish, if you wish, Allah will do that for you. If you wish, Allah will, op will leave the door of tawbah open for them. He said to him, if you wish, Allah will leave the door of mercy and tawbah open for them. Give them time to repent and to reconsider Islam. Or... Allah will make this happen and if they continue to disbelieve after that they will be punished like those before them and so this is evidence that when they make their demands and Allah makes it happen if they continue to disbelieve 
then that's it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them right away. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, rather, rather leave the door of tawbah and mercy open for them. The third lesson that we learn is that some people will never believe. No matter, no matter what sign comes to them, no matter what proof comes to them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as, as that individual said, that even then I still won't believe. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ حَقَّتْ عَلَيْهِمْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Those who, you know, the decree of Allah has already come that they won't believe. وَلَوْ جَاءَتْهُمْ كُلُّ آيَةٍ حَتَّى يَرَوْا الْعَذَابَ الْأَلِيمِ Even if every sign, every miracle was to come to them, they wouldn't believe until the punishment of Allah is in front of them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَأَصْرِفُ عَنْ آيَاتِيَ الَّذِينَ يَتَكَبَّرُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ I will ward away my ayat from those who are stubborn, those who are arrogant on earth. وَإِنْ يَرَوْ كُلَّ آيَةٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَا Even if they were to see every ayah, every sign, every proof, they wouldn't believe in it. These are our people whose hearts have been sealed. Some people may ask, why is it? Why is it that these people are destined for the hellfire? Why doesn't Allah give them a chance? The answer is that Allah gave them many chances. But they persisted upon their kufr in their stubborn ways. And so there came a time when Allah decided to seal their hearts. That's it. No matter what evidence they see, they'll never believe. And so the lesson in this is that one should never despair when he's giving da'wah to certain individuals because they're not believing. Their hidayah, their guidance rests in the hands of Allah. Allah decides. Our job is to convey the message, to make sure that they see the truth based on the evidence. And that requires effort from us. Sometimes we present to Islam, but we don't do it in the best of ways. So our job is to perfect ourselves in that only. To study Islam, to study its evidences, convincing arguments, learn about what they're saying, come with the answers. This is all part of da'wah. But then there comes a point in time when you've done all of that and they still don't believe. This is where we say, their hidayah rests in the hands of Allah. We cannot change their hearts. Finally, the last lesson that we learn is that a proof of your iman a proof of your iman is that you submit and you do not object to anything that has come from Allah and His Messenger. And you don't make demands. You don't say, if only it was like this, it should have been like this. You know, why didn't, why didn't Allah say this in the Qur'an or that? Why wasn't the evidence like this? Why wasn't the miracle of a different nature? And so on and so forth. Our job is to simply submit. And that is a proof of your iman. And that is the definition of who a Muslim is. That is the definition of who a Muslim is. Coming from the word aslama. One who submits. And so a proof of your iman is that you submit and you don't and you don't imitate the kuffar in their ways of objecting and making demands.
And so we come to the end of today's session. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, next week, we'll move on to uh, some of the last tactics that Quraysh resorted to, which were basically the last thing that they resorted to after trying everything else. And so we'll look at that next week, insha'Allah. And with that, we'll conclude uh, our discussion of the response of Quraysh and how they opposed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So we'll do that next week. And then after that, we'll move on uh, to other events in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was still in Mecca. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك وصلي اللهم وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته